you very much, Mark. Um, <clears throat> well, it was a very interesting time, and um, I thought I'd try and tackle three of these various questions we got in the document. The three I'm going to tackle are, did the MDGs lead to simplistic thinking? Is more aid needed? And can poor estates absorb more aid? So let me go quickly through those three. I, I think that the, the charge, if you like, against the MDGs is that they focused too much on, if you like, the social sectors, put it very broadly. They weren't very credible in what they said about the environment, and they left out very important things like energy and transport altogether. Um, but I think one has to say that although you, these are certainly shortcomings, and there are many other shortcomings in the MDG framework which have been much discussed, they also the MDGs were a product of a way of thinking. It wasn't, it wasn't just they were guiding thinking, they were the product of thinking. And that thinking was very much informed by the big, very successful UN conferences that started with um, John Tien on basic education uh, and the rest of it in the 1990s, which had then been taken up by the OECD and were very much in Claire Shaw's thinking when she became uh, Secretary of State. Um, and also, it's an interesting fact that in the early 1990s, the OECD put a stop to mixed credit competition for commercially viable projects through something called the Helsinki Agreement, uh, which basically made it very difficult for donors to finance whole swathes of infrastructure. In the 1980s, European donors, and I remember this very well from being one of them, fought each other desperately for projects in Indonesia and places like that with the use of soft money of various kinds. And the OECD put a stop to that. So for various <coughs> reasons, it became more interesting for donors to look at some of these um, issues around health and education, which also seems being much more, and this is certainly what the DAC concluded in its Shaping the 20th Century report, were much more things about around which northern publics could get, um, could get interested. So it became a very important part of how you sell an aid program in difficult circumstances, as always. Um, so... They're a product as well as a, as, a, as a guider of thinking. And as we look forward to the SDGs, I think the very important thing is to, is to remember that we need to have a broad enough agenda, but at the same time, I worry that the, the SDG framework is looking impossibly broad, and it's going to be very difficult to have the focus that we were able to have through the, um, through the MDGs. Do we need more aid? I think the way I look at this is that we, there are various kinds of inequality in the world. There may be growing inequality within countries. There's probably diminishing inequality if you look at everybody in the world because people are gradually getting uh, richer, at least in the middle. Um, but there's still huge disparities between countries. And as long as you've got very large inter-country inequality, and we're going to have that for the next um, 50, 60 years at least, there has to be some... Uh, ability to provide resources on concessional terms uh, across that chain. Otherwise, it's very hard to see how we can manage any sustainable global set of policies. Um, exactly how much we need, I don't know. I mean, it is extraordinary, really, when you think about it, the 0.7 target it still has any, any uh, reference, and indeed is still driving policy years after it was invented for a totally different world. Um, and uh, at some point, you know, maybe the world needs some more intellectual thought about what is the nature of the transfers that are required to run the world and how we do it, but it's, it's there and we should use it. The other thing that's very important, uh, I say this particularly with, uh, with Jan present, is that I do think we've really got to get beyond a kind of DAC accounting of um, these flows to a global accounting system which captures all inter-country official flows in a consistent way and has to have as, as an element of that Clearly, it's got, it's got to be run by the UN, ultimately. It's got to have buy-in from South-South cooperation countries who will continue to see themselves as not providing aid in, in, this, in the traditional sense, and that has to be respected. But we need a common framework to get the data right. And a, a crucial part of this is that we need to have a good metric for concessionality. How can you have a sensible conversation with a China Development Bank if, um, if the European Investment Bank, an organisation which I have huge respect, uh, wishes to claim that it's entirely unconcessional uh, transfers, exactly the same as the World Bank, should count as, as official development assistance. Uh, clearly the same must apply to the China Development Bank, but this is really the world we want to have. We want to have a metric which is robust, transparent, and applies to everybody. Finally, on um, absorptive capacity, if I can just uh, take the slides here, please. Uh, what I'm going to show you is just some, some data on um, how uh, aid dependency has moved over the last few years. Ah, oh, somebody clicked. Jolly good. What do I click? That one? Not that one. 
Why doesn't it work? It's usually the top button on these things. Hang on. It's that one. Oh, well, I should have known that. Uh, I pinched this from Dirk. Uh, it's very good charts he's done. Aid is not important for middle-income countries. Even the figure in 2005 is only an artef artifact of debt write-off to Iraq. Uh, but debt, but aid is very important for low-income countries, and these figures are as proportion of GNI, and the red line is ODA, and the uh, the purple line is domestic um, resource mobilisation. So it's still very important. If you look at um, aid dependence in Africa, which is what I looked at, and I've just compared the early part of the century with more recent times, there's a whole series of countries which are not, never have been aid dependent. There are a, a significant number of countries, this is important, where aid dependency has fallen quite significantly, even while aid is increasing, largely because of rapid growth. Uh, there's a series of uh, very significant countries in Africa where aid was pretty much the same proportion of GNI over a 10-year period. Important places like Ethiopia, uh, Malawi, Benin, and so on. And then, of course, the conflict ones, the numbers move around an, an enormous amount, and sometimes they're extremely large, that, that comes and goes. And um, uh, I've gone back to the third group again, and if you look forward using the DAC's forward look, and the DAC is a very nice forward look of how country programmable assistance, which is the, uh, the country-based form of aid, moves. Look ahead to 2015. You'll see that on the whole, these numbers are intending to shift down. And if you take a long period view of Africa as a whole, you can see that uh, aid dependency rose a bit in the middle of the 2000s and then fallen away a bit. So structurally, I don't think that aid dependency is a, an impossible problem. Uh, I particularly like this chart about Bangladesh, a country I used to deal with a lot in the, around about 79, when aid disbursements were the same as government revenue. And if you just take the 10-year changes, you'll see that although aid remained pretty uh, significant, government revenue marches far more quickly. And that's, this is what happens in all countries that develop successfully, and we should expect declining aid dependence on the, uh, on the whole. Uh, uh, but still, we, we do need to ensure that we can manage aid dependence, and that in many ways is what the whole uh, aid effectiveness debate, I think, is about, is how you handle aid more effectively in those countries where there is significant dependence. We all know dependence is very difficult to manage, it's interesting that countries like Rwanda are able to be quite assertive while being highly dependent. And I think that sets a, what we need to have is something that really ensures the governments of the recipient countries, even in an aid dependent situation, are able to be sufficiently assertive with donors. As I've often said, uh, the only countries that develop successfully are countries that have learned how to say no to donors.